Hi, welcome to this uh, first session of the afternoon on our second day of the conference entitled Supervised Injecting Civil Disobedience, Overcoming Resistance and Building Allies. Uh, we've got a great lineup of speakers here. My name's Ingrid Van Beek. I was the founding medical director of Sydney's uh, first and still only medically supervised injecting centre. Um, so this is a topic that's very near and dear to my heart and I'm really looking forward to hearing our four speakers this evening, uh, or this afternoon. Um, so yeah, uh, the speakers are actually going to introduce themselves, so I won't do that. Um, and we're going to have them speak for about 15 minutes each and then we'll have questions at the end, which I think as most of the sessions have been doing, we'll try and bundle them up a bit um, so we get a good uh, half an hour to have questions and answers at the end. So yeah, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we are meeting today, pay our respects to the Boon Wurrung and Wurundjeri Wurrung, I've got that wrong, I'm sorry, peoples of the Kulin Nation. Uh, we pay our respects to elders across this land and their never ending push for change. We recognise and pay respect to future elders and other um, people who may be here in relation to that. Um, I also want to say that uh, I put my own sort of heartfelt um, uh, emotions into hoping that our referendum that we have here later this year uh, to enshrine uh, Indigenous views into a voice to the Australian Parliament. I strongly hope that that gets through. Um, and this won't happen just by some sort of magic. It's really up to us. So for the Australians in the room, what you need to do is find someone, at least one person in your group of friends who doesn't agree with the voice and you need to change their mind. If we all do that, it will be, it will get through in a landslide. Okay. which it deserves to, but goodness knows, we live in a strange world these days. Uh, okay, so, sorry, I've just lost my page. <laughs> so it gives me pleasure to introduce Kayla Demong, who's going to probably pronounce her name better than I have, and she's our, our first speaker this afternoon. Hello, everybody. I'm not used to people not being able to spell or say Demong because my previous last name was Hernaviich. <laughs> and so, like, nobody ever knew that one. Um, oh, there we go. Um, so, I'm Kayla Demong. I am the executive director for a um, harm reduction organization in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, Canada. So for most people who only know Toronto and Vancouver and Canada, I'm in the middle. Um, and I am here to talk to you today about our safe consumption site um, and a little presentation that I've called Little SCS on the Prairies, totally taking it from Little House on the Prairies. <laughs> oh. No, it's not going. <laughs> okay, you can go past that one. <laughs> um, so just to start, I want to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land that we are meeting on today and pay respect to their elders of past, present, and future. I also want to recognize the stolen lands that I come from in Canada. Um, our story in Canada is very similar, um, very much similar to what we see in um, Australia here. And I'm visiting from what is known as Treaty Sticks territory and the stolen lands from the Cree, Dene, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, Soto, and Métis people. Um, so a little snapshot located in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, Canada. We've been operating since 1986. We were prior, previously known as an organization called Aid Saskatoon. So like so many harm reduction um, organizations, we started um, our work in the HIV world. Our safe consumption site opened its doors in October 1st, 2020. Um, and our provincial government has denied us funding four years in a row. And we're gonna learn why that's a very unique situation in Canada. 
<laughs> um, this naloxone kit is the front of our building. So we wanted to make it very obvious what was happening inside of this building and make a very strong stance that we were very proud of what we were doing. So a little bit of context. Saskatchewan has about 1.2 million people. Um, Saskatoon's population is about 285,000 with about 260,000 Indigenous people living in Saskatchewan and 70 First Nations communities. Approximately 95% of the people that access services in our safe consumption site and our drop-in centre are Indigenous. Saskatchewan is leading our nation in HIV transmission um, and we're going to talk about why that's so important. So the original reason we opened the safe consumption site had to do with HIV transmission in our community. Um, we were experiencing overdose deaths, but very minimally compared to what we were seeing in other parts of our country. Um, and we wanted a way to in engage people who were at risk of transmission and engage people who were living with HIV. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about what HIV in Saskatchewan looks like compared to the rest of the country. So this is taken from Katy, which is a national AIDS organization. Um, but Saskatchewan, if you can see on this thing, 67.7% um, of our HIV transmission is intravenous drug use. We're the only province like that in the whole entire country. Our second highest risk population is heterosexual women of childbearing age. Um, again, very unique in the country. These are our transmission rates for 2021. We're almost five times the national average. And this is very important to point out because even in Canada, nobody's talking about this. I'm burying people in their 20s of AIDS in this day and age, which is absolutely disgusting. And sorry, it makes me very sad. <laughs> Um, so when we started talking about opening a safe consumption site, it was about five years of planning, four of which we spent wasted trying to get other people on board. Um, and when I say we, for many, many years, organization was run with by me and our previous executive director, Jason Mercury. And so conveniently, him and I got to make all the decisions. Um, so we made the decisions to do a whole bunch of things that nobody probably would have done because we felt we could. Um, but it all started as round how can we engage people who are using substances, injecting drugs, and lessen our HIV transmission. In the process of all of this, we then started to have an overdose epidemic that started to come through right before the pandemic um, and seeing um, poison drug supply coming in. In our safe consumption site, 100% of what we test comes back positive for fentanyl, with only about 3% of the people actually knowingly using fentanyl in the site. Most commonly, the substance used in Saskatchewan is crystal meth. Now, from a financial point of view, as anybody that's ever dealt drugs, putting fentanyl in your crystal meth in Canada is not cost effective because a point of meth in Saskatchewan costs $10. Um, and fentanyl is much more expensive. So we've never really figured out fiscally why they're trying to do it. But what it results in is that we're seeing people being constantly poisoned, and it is poisoning. Um, so this is our safe consumption site. This is one part of our safe consumption site, which looks super clinical. On the other side is a plant wall and a huge mural of like majestic flowers and rolling hills and all sorts of things. We got seven booths. We're very well known in Canada because we had the only inhalation space for a long time. So one of the things that we decided when we opened the site, since nobody wanted to do it with us, we thought we'll just do what we want. And um, because crystal meth is so popular, a lot of people smoke drugs. <coughs> So it felt really stupid at the time to say, you can come in if you're injecting, but if you're smoking, you don't get to come in the door. Um, which again, just continues to perpetuate stigmas around using substances, because somehow you're less than if you smoke your meth versus shoot it up. Um, it's overseen by a paramedic. We did this for financial reasons. <laughs> um, all the other sites in Canada use nursing. We're the only one that uses paramedics. In hindsight, it's actually a fantastic model, and I encourage other sites to look at it as well because paramedics are incredibly well trained for overdose prevention and emergency response. Where nurses, I know in Saskatchewan, we've been looking at it for a while, and what we keep hearing back from the college is that it's not enough nursing to be justifiable. So we use a paramedic and he's wonderful. Um, I have the word peer 
in quotation marks because I hate the word peer and I might piss some people off, I'm sorry. Um, but in Saskatchewan and across Canada, what we see with peer workers is that they're often tokenized and we still see a lot of people being paid in gift certificates and um, or paid $10 an hour for work that a social worker is doing for $30 an hour. So all of our staff are just workers. Um, doesn't matter why they're there. We have no criteria or disting like no level of education is required for any of our positions besides our paramedic because no amount of first aid makes you a paramedic unfortunately so he has to be a paramedic <laughs> but none of our other staff um, are based on education and myself come from a history of drug use and like so many people who use drugs decided I just wanted to spend the rest of my life hanging out with people that use drugs and um, I have very little education to do what I'm doing <laughs> Um, which is probably why it's worked so well. Um, our SES is directly attached to our drop-in center. So that's open to everyone. Um, our safe consumption site serves currently about 700 individuals and in our drop-in center supporting about 1,000 individuals. Um, all people experiencing homelessness. We're very well known in our community for working for all, with all the people that nobody else will. We have a big issue, I don't know about your communities, where people are banned from services a lot, um, often because of the service providers are assholes, um, to be perfectly honest. I'm a strong believer that if people aren't engaging with your program, your program's the problem. Um, and so it's a very busy place. Um, in our drop-in center, we have all sorts of things. We have case management, we have nurse practitioners, we have housing workers and pet therapy and art therapy and cultural supports that people can choose to access if they want or if they don't want to talk to anybody, they don't have to. So back to the peer thing a little bit. We employ people who hang out a lot to be there a lot. And the difference between us and a lot of other um, organizations where we come from they're paid at the same pay scale as everybody else. There's no variance of pay scale for any department in our whole organization. And if you work more than 15 hours a week, you get paid health benefits. Um, and there's, so there's no separation between our people who are actively using drugs, our people that used to use drugs, our people that sometimes use drugs, and all the rest of the staff that come. Everybody's on the same playing field, and everybody receives the same training, training and access to every resource. So how do we afford to do this if the province isn't going to pay for us? So just so you know, we're the only site in Canada that has been denied funding like this. No other site has ever experienced this. We didn't really think we would either. Um, so Jason and I, being the crazy people we are, we started a clothing line. Um, <laughs> so that's number one. We sell t-shirts and merchandise to fund our safe consumption site. It has gone incredibly well. All the designs and art that you've seen throughout my presentation are all things that have been put on our merchandise. Um, we pay local artists to make the merchandise or to design the art. Um, we often designate one design per launch to support another organization. So we've done a lot of things with Mom Stop the Harm, which in Canada is a group of moms who have lost children and family members to overdose, who do wicked amounts of advocacy in our country um, to um, address the overdose crisis that we're dealing with. We launch stuff a couple times a year. Within 24 hours, on average, we're dealing with 400 to 500 orders within 24 hours. Um, we only design, launch each design once, which is part of the appeal, almost except for our last launch, where we ran a poll on our social media where people got to vote to bring some merch back, um, which went really, really well. Um, so we run a full social enterprise, is what it's turned into, which you can get lots of funding for in Canada, it turns out. Um, all of the management of the store is done by me and a girl named Miranda out of our office, which our building is like half the size of this room. Um, social media is our primary tool of promotion and the items are currently being sent all over the world. And last month we received our first Australian order. So that was very exciting. So we have gone global. Um, the other thing is we became the organization that everyone wanted to support. And we did this by being very loud in the news. Um, when we decided to open the site, we announced before we had any plan, like we had bought a building and we just said, there's a safe consumption site going in this building. We don't really care if you say yes or no, this is what we're doing. 
It made us really controversial because our province was not in support of it. We, the second year that we were denied funding, in less than a month during a pandemic, local businesses had raised $180,000 to support the safe consumption site after that budget announcement. The theater in the corner wasn't even open. They sold bags of popcorn out their front door for 48 hours and raised $10,000. This handsome man in the corner is my friend John. Um, <laughs> he's a local real estate agent who donates part of his commissions every year to the safe consumption site, which is now probably close to $25,000 in um, support that he has given us. So how did this happen? Again, we became very well known. When we announced the same day, the way we had coordinated is our mayor, our chief of police and chief of fire announced that they were in support of it, which meant that a whole population of people that didn't really care what we were doing became curious about it. We did 20 days of two tours a night openly, and we still open up for tours. And by the end of all of those tours, people, well, people were handing us checks, which was super awesome. Um, the denials have made us more newsworthy. I spend most of my week talking to reporters, commenting, we're now commenting on national news all over the place. The day that decrim went through in BC, I spent all day talking to reporters from all over because people start care what we have to say. And because of that, we've been able to keep the safe consumption site operating and growing and sustainable. Um, and we have, this awareness means that we have community groups, churches, businesses, constantly fundraising for us on an average of probably four to five fundraisers a week being done by way where we do zero work for any of it. So yeah, that's our little safe consumption site. That's a fantastic story. Thank you, Kayla. So our next presenter is Peter Ker Krikant. Um, he's going to present on lessons learned from Glasgow's unsanctioned site, how to run an unsanctioned safer injection site. I hope you've got one of those nice Scottish accents. Uh, <laughs> Hi. Um, cry can't. You're nearly right. Cry can't. Um, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, talk a lot about, about uh, the unsanctioned uh, mobile facility that I ran in Glasgow. Um, yeah, my name is Peter Crycant and I work for, now work for an organisation called Cranston, um, Harm Reduction and Social Justice Charity in the UK. So just to put into uh, context a little bit about you know, the reasoning behind uh, starting an unsanctioned uh, mobile facility. Um, to put it into context, uh, Scottish drug deaths are at an all-time high. Um, I'm sure those that were at the opening ceremony um, probably heard Helen Clark mention Scotland in the same sentence as America and Canada. And recording 295 deaths per million of the population aged between 15 to 60 to 40. Again, to try and put that into some sort of context, we don't have any synthetic opioids. Um, so there's no fentanyl or any synthetic opioids currently in our heroin supply chain. Um, but we are still seeing, you know, drug death rates on a par with Canada and North America, um, you know, per head of population. Um, also in Glasgow, uh, around about 2014, the first detection of HIV um, in the public injecting uh, community within the city centre of Glasgow started, uh, and that's ra over a five-year period. It became the largest outbreak of HIV that the United Kingdom had seen, um, and in the 30 years prior to that, um, and a mass level of public injecting in the city centre of Glasgow, with an estimated 500 plus people regularly out in public, in alleyways, abandoned buildings, um, injecting in rat infested alleyways, really unsterile conditions. Um, <clears throat> and the UK government 
you know, we've got this really conservative government and it's not getting any better. You know, the opposition, the Labour government, uh, the Labour opposition just now, the, the rhetoric is all around, um, you know, tough on crime, tough on the causes of crime, absolutely naming and shaming people who use drugs. Um, so it's not getting any better. So that's kind of the context of why um, I decided uh, to just go out and start a, a, a mobile facility. Um, so I bought an old rusty transit van and drove it out and into Glasgow and uh, you know people started coming and using in the van, um, injecting and uh, <laughs> It was, you know, there was lots of, lots of different strengths and weaknesses to it. You know, when you've got such a, a large community of people, you know, obviously capacity was, uh, you know, a real, real difficulty. Um, I think the, 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 the most difficult part for me was um, it was down to me and a couple of other people, you know, like hearing um, stories from Canada, you know, like, so he's here uh, in the Moss Park site, you know, of like 150 people coming and standing and volunteering and doing stuff and going to Copenhagen, Copenhagen and getting to meet with uh, Nana Goodfinson and uh, Michael Lundberg, who, you know, were involved at the beginning when they started their unsanctioned mobile facility, you know, and hearing about doctors and street lawyers and nurses all coming out and volunteering and helping and supporting. You know, it was basically me, a sex worker, and a retired nurse, three of us, um, you know, that, that kind of went out every day and just done what we'd done, you know. And when you're seeing people, um, you know, there's stories of, like, people in wheelchairs who, you know, have already lost legs, um, and the, the wheelchair's only got uh, three wheels on it. You know, it's like, it's missing a front wheel. Uh, the, the people can literally not get about unless there's somebody to push them, you know, and you're having to lift people with, um, you know, who have already lost legs and you're having to lift them into the back of a van um, just so that they've got a little bit of light, safety and, um, you know, dignity. Um, uh, uh, that, that was probably the hardest part for me. Um, <clears throat> you know, while people are continuing to die around you, um, you, you know, your, your friends are, and your family and the people that you care about are continuing to die around you and there's no sort of real support within it. So there was lots of stuff in terms of like time restraints, you know, would like, I'd be, I, I'd be sort of in the van, you know, like making sure that people were okay, you know, clean, clean equipment. One of the other volunteers would be standing at one side of the alleyway, the other one would be standing at the other side of the alleyway and would be looking for police just in case the police were coming, you know, so we could lock vans and make sure that the people were safe. Um, <clears throat> so it was, yeah, there was loads of, there was loads of challenges and, and what I would say about if you're going to, if you're in a country where, you know, you've got these mass levels of people dying around you and you're going to do something like this, build the community around you first um, because you, you, you'll need that support and you'll need that help. And there was no, there was no like rules or anything, like it was just four simple agreements to, to access the support in the van. Uh, people agree to an intervention, they don't deal inside the vehicle, no abusive or aggressive behaviour towards us, which there never was anyway, you know, like when you're, when you're part of your community, you're part of your community, you know. Um, and everybody in the context, obviously, of the HIV outbreak and the mass levels of powder form cocaine injecting, um, no in sharing injecting equipment. <clears throat> so we, we, we did uh, operate for about 10 months before, unfortunately, my biggest regret is that I had to, I had to stop uh, running the service. I, 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 you know, I just physically couldn't do it anymore. Um, but over the 10 months, we, we probably, you know, there was probably over a thousand injections, but I started collecting um, some of the data, you know, we were trying to prove this could work in the context of, you know, the legal framework in the 1971 Mistress of Drugs Act, talks about substances like opium and uh, cannabis and premises not being allowed for, for those types of substances to be inhaled. 
So that was one reason why we, we didn't go for inhalation. We weren't allowing people because I was trying to prove that actually we can do this. It's an injecting site. It's not breaking any laws. And I still hold this to this day. If, I think if the, the police could have found uh, something within the Misuse of Drugs Act, they would have come and closed it down. You know, they stood and watched every day um, and they never. So, um, so the question right now is, is why is it... Why is the Scottish Government still not doing this? Why is nobody taking this up? Why is none of the services that are meant to be designed to support and help people taking this up and doing it? Um, <clears throat> so, you know, we, we did get uh, the data uh, covered um, and there is a publication out there. It was by Dr Gillian Shorter from Queen's Belfast University, uh, also, also Magdalena Harris, some of you will know from uh, here and Alex Stevens, as well as uh, Kirsten Trainer and Andrew McCauley. can send that to anybody uh, who wants it. Um, also, should mention as well, you know, like one of the, although we've not got synthetic opioids in our heroin supply chain, one of the biggest uh, causes for, for overdose at the moment is benzodiazepines. Um, you know, I don't know who was in the session about uh, the, the, the recovery agenda. Um, now, that's hit Scotland worse than any other country in the United Kingdom. Um, you know, we created a, you know, a, a generation of people who were dependent on benzodiazepines by readily prescribing, and then all of a sudden the UK government in 2010 say everybody's to stop taking drugs and we're going to live in a drug drug-free utopia, so we stopped prescribing them. So, of course, street benzodiazepines came on the scene full of a tizzle arm, um, you know, which is, I don't know, eight, eight, to times, eight to ten times stronger than what people were getting prescribed through, you know, a, a safe supply previously, and now people go back and they, they want a safe supply, and they're like, you know, I, I'm, to lay it on the line, I'm not a doctor, I'm not an academic or anything, I'm just a person who uses drugs, who cares about my community. Um, but you go back and people ask for a safe supply now and, 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 and they can't get it. Nobody will prescribe anything to them. So, so I think what we've started to do in Cranston is we've started to look at this as a blueprint. So we're now out, we're pushing the Scottish Government, we're pushing local authorities in England and Wales and uh, Northern Ireland to say that we can operate these services and we've got a blueprint to operate them, I, either as a fixed site model or as a hybrid model of fixed site and also mobile facilities in areas or uh, places where you know we have a little bit more um, rural areas that we can reach out to. We are currently operating, um, this is a mobile harm reduction service, um, but it is set up to be able to operate in the West Midlands as a, an overdose prevention service. Um, and as I say, we've got the blueprints there to try and operate them under um, current legal frameworks. So just to kind of give you a little bit of, you know, the pu pu public and political, I mean, at the same time as trying to, you know, like, do this on a day-to-day -day basis and support people, um, you know, and, 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 and make sure people were safe. You know, I was trying to deal with uh, uh, the, the, the political and the, the, you know, the constant, like, news and me media attention all the time, you know, from, like, the New York Times to, you know, BBC, etc., etc. So this is kind of like a timeline. The, the first uh, injection was supervised on the 11th of September. We actually started on International Overdose Awareness Day on the 31st of August, but it took a couple of weeks for the police to kind of back off a little bit and for people to feel safe enough to come to the, the vehicle for a, uh, to, to have a hat. Um, so, the, as I say, the first injection on the 11th of September. Now, the biggest intervention was when the, the police charged me so this completely backfired on them. They, they charged me because there was three people in the back of the van using, and I was like, you're not getting in. I locked the doors, so allegedly, allegedly, um, <laughs> allegedly, I, 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 locked the, I locked the door, and, uh, and once, obviously, the drugs were consumed and the people in the van felt safe for me to open the door, the, the door was open, but the drugs were consumed, so there was nothing illegal going on. Um, so this was a big turning point, though, when they, when they charged me, because I expected when it went out on BBC and Twitter and on the front pages of the paper, I didn't expect to get the support that I got from that. I mean, it was, it was overwhelming, to be honest. Um, you know, like, especially on somewhere like Twitter, where 
you know, like it can be such a nasty environment if you're, a, you know, if you're if you're in this environment. Certainly, uh, you know, in terms of the recovery agenda, again, you know, and the the, the you know the, the the people that have got very loud voices that have, you know, that, that call themselves an alcoholic, but they've not had a drink in thirty years. Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, so that was that was that was a big turning point because ninety percent of the stuff on Twitter was all like, what are the police doing, what are they get involved for. Then the, the the charge went to the Crown and Prosecutor Fiscal Service, and they they dropped the charges, so they didn't pursue the charges. So from then, you know, I got to meet with Nicola Sturgeon, um, which was actually really disappointing because I told her we need widespread diamorphine-assisted treatment, and she stood up in the Scottish Parliament a week later and said we're going to make uh, the finances available for widespread diamorphine-assisted treatment this financial year. That was January 2021. We've still got no more diamorphine-assisted treatment than we had then. Um, then the drug policy minister, you know, coming out and saying that like, we're going to have OPCs, these are going to happen, despite Boris Johnson, despite the UK government, we're going to get these facilities up and running. Um, and again, it's just really frustrating because, you know, that's August 2021, you know, so we're coming up two years since this big announcement that, that, that Scotland's going to defy the big bad UK government and open my sight. Um, you know, and like one of the first things I'd done in this was a, a, a some of you maybe have heard of drug science and Professor David Knott, you know, I'd done a podcast with him and you know, it's like he says like he's been saying it for years, you know, like the the Scottish government could go ahead and open these facilities, you know, what are the UK government gonna do, you know, because we open a little injecting centre in, in Glasgow, they're gonna send in the tanks. Um and I know there'll be a lot of abolitionists in this room who are anti-monarchy and not interested, but I'm, well, I'm going to include this anyway, because I think I'm the first and only person to meet the Queen and say to her, and when she asked me what I was here for, I said, I'm here because I drove a van into Glasgow and let people inject drugs in the back here. Um, <laughs> so you can, you, can, you can probably see the, the, the reaction on her face. <laughs> uh, but, <laughs> So just some references uh, and also my contact details. And again, I just want to thank everybody for giving me this time to talk. Thank you. I love that picture of you and the Queen. <laughs> Maybe that's what did her in. So, so it now gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Nico Clark. He's the medical director of Australia's second medically supervised injecting room, first here in Victoria, uh, located in North Richmond. And I think some of you might have an opportunity to go and visit uh, that facility, an incredibly busy, wonderfully run facility that goodness knows has had its uh, trials and tribulations. Got to say, um, I was involved in the clinical protocol development for this facility uh, three years ago and I was a little bit jealous. I thought, oh, you know, it's going to be so easy for these guys uh, compared to how it was for us, but no. Uh, it's very own challenges. These things certainly haven't proven to be simple here in this country. So his presentation, operating a harm reduction service in a risk intolerant context. Thanks, Ingrid. <clears throat> um, Todd, um, we've had a sanctioned um, uh, supervised uh, consumption room, always the second one, but we're happy with that. Um, we, um, it's been uh, almost five years and the government's just announced that the five-year trial is now, um, they've decided to make, take away the trial status and they've, they've, they've kind of made, they introduced legislation so that it doesn't have a, an end date for the continuation of the service. So we're, we're very excited about that. <coughs> um, um, 
in terms of um, but it, it's I, I'd like to share a little bit of the the our experiences in 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 running this service over the of the last five years and the clash between really the the you know the principles of harm reduction and the and the risk appetite of the people who use the service with the kind of the risk appetite of those who kind of fund the service those the context that we're in which is really completely different way of looking at the world and puts particular challenges on us who are trying to um, provide that that service that the people who are uh, coming along every day they need and to just share some reflections on that um, but you know so far at least we we have still been funded let me see how we go so these are some of the risk contexts that that are that I'll reflect upon so the first one this is our location if you haven't had the chance to come and have a look at it we're in the midst of Victoria's largest public housing estate and where it says Victoria Road, which is actually Victoria Street. So that's the drug market, the main drug street drug market, in, and it's just a couple of hundred metres away. And where it says proposed injecting room, so that's, that's the community health centre um, that was set up 50 years ago to service the public housing estate and has had a, a needle and syringe program distributing a million syringes kind of going back over many years and a pro an out program of people uh, supporting the people who use drugs in that housing estate and around it through outreach workers, often managing overdoses and the building immediately behind, which is a multi-storey car park, and, and those workers having managed hundreds and hundreds of overdose, not thousands of overdoses over those years. And yes, right next to a primary school, which was also put in the middle of the housing estate to serve the needs of the housing estate. Um, 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 that if you look around the laneways in Richmond, um, in the past at least, you would often see masses of syringes everywhere. Um, now that's changed so much because both because they've reduced, but also because everyone's going around picking them up to try and. Um, but uh, and and here's Judy who's in the audience here. We've had a local local. Um, support really advocacy program that was very effective at building the the uh, consciousness of the need for the service and getting everybody on board and um, there's Judy standing next to a sign they put up you talk we die with the names of the 35 people the coroner had said had died in a 12-month period from in in around the Richmond purchasing and using drugs in around the Richmond area and so um, you know that's in the, the that's in the context in which the um, the government. Um, oops, uh, is there an easier way of going forward? Anyway, that's all right. So the government announced the room, and we see the the premier there. Fiona Patton is also here. We see police, the local member, ambulance, the police. You know, the police minister. Um, and so on and so forth. And this is the building that was built out the front of the Community Health Centre. It took 12 months to be built, and in the big first 12 months we operated from in the Community Health Centre. And it looks like, well, that's what it looked like when it was new. Now it's, it looks much more lived in uh, after almost 400,000 visits. Um, but it's a, just to show you the design a little bit, it's one, it, we did manage to convince them, and this is largely due to kind of the, uh, the outreach team itself said, you know, we need to build more than just an injecting room. It needs a, it needs capacity to provide services at the same time. So that red area up the top there is a little on-site clinic for the provision of a range of services in addition to the community health centre, which is right next door. Um, um, and then, as you can see there, the school is right next to it, you know, just... Um, Sorry, that slide's not very clear. So that's the physical context in which we're in. And then, of course, the it was set up as a trial. These were the objectives of the trial, to not just to reduce overdose, uh, but also to provide um, uh, social support, health and social support, but reduce needles. But the challenging one was kind of improving neighbourhood amenity. Um, and yet we weren't neither given the resources nor the permission to, to do this one. We weren't, we weren't, uh, that was considered too risky for us to do, to engage with the neighbours. Um, and the government wanted to do that part of it itself. But I don't think the government's very, really, I mean, the governments are good at lots of things, but they're not really good at that kind of grassroots neighbourhood engagement, I don't think. Um, so the, the, 
the, some of the more challenging things is like the media environment in which we're living. So, of course, no sooner had we opened than, you know, the next day, that, you know, or a few days later, they call it, they, you know, they've, um, they, you know, there's hundreds of these uh, headlines um, putting clients' faces, uh, people's faces on the front, very stigmatizing language. I think it's probably actually illegal to use the language in, with, in law in Victoria here if uh, it's a protected attribute if it's a, under disability due to a, a substance use disorder is like any other disability is considered. You know, now you might not consider it a disability but at least within that legal framework it would be illegal to use the language that's used in in, um, in that uh, in, the, in the newspapers. Um, um, you know and so we had to and, and there's really this kind of framework that shock horror we saw a syringe it was gonna you know my life is intolerable and in and that the environment that you know we, we we're still while we're while we have a center we're putting more people in prison than ever before so most countries are going the other direction we're just spending half a billion dollars on a new prison and it, and you know if, at least if you look at the women's prison i think 90 percent of the women who are there are for drug related charges it, it's um in men it's not quite that high and so we are you know, we're in a context in which politicians are terrified of being seen on soft on crime. And so while they might fund an injecting room, they put their dollars into the prison still. Um, um, so, you know, and they're terrified of the kind of Murdoch press in a way, even though we've seen it's having less and less influence on the actual um, outcome of elections. Uh, in Victoria. It certainly is monitored closely by the, the government's media team. Um, and, uh, and when it comes to our interaction with the press, you know, that is extremely closely um, regulated as part of the contractual agreement with the government. In fact, we can't, we don't have free access to the press to kind of, even if somebody says something about us in the press, which is untrue. So you've got, you know, this government's media team, it's, you know, public knowledge, there's hundreds of media advisors of the Premier's department alone, then all the minister's offices have got their media department. We're in an environment in which there's a lot of control over the media where possible to try and influence the narrative. And I think that's very good at some things. It's not good at uh, allowing a kind of the good news of services like that to come out. And, and I think there would be much more support for the kind of things that we're doing if there was kind of much more kind of um, um, uh, kind of a free-flowing dialogue uh, between us and the local community. Whereas at the moment we just see the, the voices of a small number of people who are very kind of fixed in their views. And, and that's the, you know, the voices of people who use drugs are nowhere to be heard in that debate at all. So um, what are we up to? The government context then. So here's our Premier announcing it, which is a brave thing to announce. It wasn't, wasn't sure that there would be political support for it. And he was really kind of, he really went in the idea that people are dying and that's not okay. It's interesting if you, I mean, I've had the chance to look at different political announcements over the years. And I, I, you know, comparing this to seeing the announcement of the injecting room in Greece recently where the Prime Minister was there, and they were announcing, you know, they're so pleased to announce the room was opened or reopened in that case. And they put it in the sense that the people who were there, they deserve this, they deserve care, they deserve support, they deserve resources, and they're very happy to be providing it. Whereas if, uh, that's not quite the narrative that was coming from our politicians. It was like, you know, these group of people, they, they've been a bit naughty, but we don't want them to die. And uh, so it's, it's for it, that kind of, uh, you know, and we're going to keep them alive, you know, but we want them to stop injecting, we want them to behave themselves. And, and that, I think, didn't help the narrative because it didn't encourage people to understand the underlying issues and that, in fact, uh, and it's, it kind of, um, you know, it kind of reinforces the need that perhaps prisons are the best places for, the, for people, but w until we can get them there, we'll just keep them alive in an injecting room, which is, you know, which sounds very cynical in a way, but that's, if you look at where the dollars go, that's a little bit what our policy is in Victoria. Um, nonetheless, we did manage to succeed in reducing overdoses, and that's just in the first 18 months. Uh, and then with some more coronial data, we've seen, you know, the, the um, column on the left was before the trial and now after the trial that you can see it's almost half the overdose cases in Yarra, which is the municipality around, 
the injecting room, whereas there's been no real reduction in the, the rest of Melbourne. Um, that's deaths. I mean, it's a, you know, we've seen big reductions in ambulance overdose database. So that's, um, but, um, you know, it was very sensitive for the government. The, uh, you know, not the election just, just happened, but the election before, the opposition, it was the, they had a, a list of 10 things we're going to do if we win government. And on top of the list was that we're going to shut down the injecting room. That was number one, you know, for day one in government, we're going to shut down the injecting room. Um, you know, it's like such a small issue in many ways. It's just because of the, you know, the identity era of kind of identity kind of politics that we're in. In a way, they wanted to kind of make it, that was the the thing that they chose to put on the very top of the list. So that's why there's such government sensitivity. Obviously, they really felt that they could lose an election on this. There wasn't enough an election. It wasn't an issue that enough people are cared about to really gain them a lot of votes, but they really did think they could lose the election if it didn't go well. As it turned out, they, you know, they, they did terribly in that election, and in the analysis that kind of came out that they, you know, the injector, you know, and the stance that the opposition had taken lost them votes, and so it worked out in our favour. But they were still very nervous moving forward. And they are so nervous that when there was a negative media event that I'll come to a little bit later, they, um, you know, they fired the CEO of the of the community health centre, maybe, or they kind of the board fired them, but you know, potentially, um, because they, you know, that's what the government wanted, and and that really put huge pressure on this tiny community health centre. And then, you know, when subsequent CEOs came in, they felt this huge pressure to kind of meet the government's expectation in that way. Um, but you know, if, if the government, you know, meeting an expectation not to have any negative media when, you know, there's no positive media coming out, and it's just, uh, you know, this basically Murdoch can publish what Murdoch wants. It's a kind of very challenging situation, and so that made the, you know, our community health centre, which had been, uh, you know, a fantastically community-focused health centre, suddenly torn between meeting the needs of the community and pleasing the government which was funding it and and struggling to kind of do both of those things and because it was really a small community health center it's very difficult to kind of have stand up to the government in you know constructive dialogue where in a way that larger health services are able to do i can see ingrid's about to give me the wind up so we can move forward a little bit so the law enforcement context. So, in, it's in addition to the fact that you know that we have a you know a situation where lots of people end up in prison as a result of their substance use, we had an event where one of the outreach workers, now in fact two of them were charged and one of those charges were dropped, related to what the the magistrate had considered the the event considered a kind of non profitable dealing. Uh, of kind of uh, of one of the outreach workers of the community health centre who'd been there for some time, as uh, so been employed as a peer worker, and 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 clearly the police in there looking at what was happening in the area, had kind of came had discovered that this outreach worker was kind of helping people out with connections. Who would say, "Can you help me out? I haven't got I haven't got any money to score." Can you? And he would kind of, you know. In, in a way, he was not personally, but it, by through his connections, he was helping people uh, get heroin, and then they're paying him back. Um, and he had to go to jail for a year for that. But the way that that was kind of targeted, and and uh, you know, that's certainly against the law in Victoria. The police can do that, but the the manipulation of the media about, around that event kind of blew it out of all proportion. And that put the pressure on the government to kind of fire the CEO. So the community health centre lost the CEO, you know, several of the senior management. The whole outreach team was defunded. It, you know, it had to go through this massive review, and it's kind of not the same. In a way, it's not the same as it used to be. It's not the same community focus as it had as it was initially. And but and again, a completely disproportionate effect response in many ways. Then we get to the local resident context. So. There were some uh, pretty fiery debates in the pub across the road, ironically. Um, in this one, one of the, the um, one somebody stood up and said, I'm going to get a machine gun and walk down Victoria Street and shoot everybody. And uh, everyone laughs. And even the, the MC of the event, who was a local councillor, didn't say anything that that you know that that was not okay in any way whatsoever. And you know, I, I thought, well, I'm not going to participate in these events anymore if that's the way. But you know, I was in this one down the down the back there somewhere. But there was there was a lot of concern in the local community. But 
we found that when you talk to people one on one, they go from kind of most people go from kind of thinking the service is terrible to wanting to volunteer. They kind of think it's amazing when they understand the support it does. But in the beginning, they kind of really struggle. There are some people, however, who, who are, for whatever reason, are completely dead against it. And you see, this is a little photo. This is a photo of, it was alleged to have been a, um, a child of the person who's injecting. Look, this person takes their child with them and they're injecting. Uh, this was observed by one of the staff at the community health centre of the person who took the photo's child saying, go and stand over there next to that person and I'll take the photo. And that went in the paper from that. So, and, and then, you know, we, we saw people raiding the, the needle, the, um, the, the syringe bins to take out the syringes to throw them on the street and take photographs and show what was happening. Um, there was somebody died overnight when the injecting room was closed and then again, well, look what's happening. If you have an injecting room, everyone's going to die and, you know, of course, it was made fun of. Um, but there are many local in, in the community who support the centre. In fact, the, majority, the vast majority do and through engagement with those ones. Um, you know, I think there is the possibility for more understanding of the issues of substance use in the community. We have a meal once a month where everybody comes together, including the people who use the injecting room, people who live in the flats, and people who use the community health centre. But um, um, the final one, if I'm allowed a couple of minutes, is, is the healthcare management context. So we are a health service, perhaps more so than any or many other injecting room, and there are, there are pros and cons of that. One of the challenges of that is that these expectations, you know, certainly here there's been this big expectation that violence towards healthcare staff is never okay, um, and, and then the definition of when that violence starts and what to do about it kind of is tricky. And so we had a lot of pressure from the nurses and, and midwives federation that if, you know, somebody's a bit rude, out they go and they can't come back kind of thing. And, you know, and to kind of stand up to people and say, you can't talk to me like that, you know, and uh, as opposed to a kind of more compassionate, you know, either just ignore it, somebody's having a bad day or kind of engaging in a more constructive way with that person. It's very easy to escalate a situation into a fight where somebody's really aggressive and you say, right, off you go. And to, to convince the staff that that's actually the way to manage these situations, to give people the skills to manage that situation. We're, we're a, a service which is half nurses and half non-nurses non or harm reduction practitioners. And finding enough nurses who have those skills is a challenge sometimes. But that's one of the risk management frameworks. But it, also from a healthcare perspective, you know, we, have, we are held to the standard of healthcare service. We're accredited. Um, and we're subject to all the regulations of any healthcare service. In fact, Ingrid was involved in, you know, one of the one of those standard ways of making health services, you know, accountable. And you know, we have kind of been scrutinised by every scrutin every mechanism that I'm aware of of scrutinising a healthcare service has been applied to us, because everybody's so nervous and they don't want to be the one who's accused of not doing the, got the job of holding the service accountable. Everything, even to the the toilets, you know, the risk of kind of avoiding anybody dying in the toilets. We've had to go to extreme measures of designing toilets with doors that swing out, with holes underneath, with no hangers, with motion detectors, with a timer with an electronic system of recording who's in the toilet and not just to kind of prevent the risk of somebody dying in the toilet. But we've kind of tried to devise a system which has maintains the principles of harm reduction for the healthcare for the for the harm reduction aspect of the service, the injecting room aspect, the and giving people the choice if they want to to participate in the healthcare aspect of it, to then provide their identity, to then have a medical record, to then get on the spot hepatitis C diagnosis and treatment, to get on the spot, well, normally within 24 hours, opiate pharmacotherapy if people want it, uh, to get a range of other services including oral healthcare and things like that. Um, and, you know, I mentioned it because it really did help us in that kind of um, avoid some of the critics by when you know when people, we would say that we're, we're providing treatment and it's in fact these days it's usually with either the the, the buvidal or the um, supplicate long-acting injectable buprenorphine products you know with significant reductions in heroin use and you know p happy client outcomes good client outcomes that that has made it much more difficult for the people to say, well, look, they're just supporting drug use, we should shut them down. And I think that did contribute to us uh, enabling us staying open in the end. So we've, we've started more than 800 people on opiate pharmacotherapy in the last few years. So 
just and we're the, the main the, the largest treatment provider for hepatitis C in the state. So just in summary then we we operate between do two very different risk management approaches and frameworks. Uh, and sometimes there's really complete incompatibility and that really presents a challenge. And we've you know, seen some examples from other services. We've, we've operated within our legal context. We've worked with the government and uh, for all the pros and cons of doing that. Uh, but we have, where it's been possible, found ways of kind of meeting both those government and other risk expectations and the needs of our clients. And I think where, where there is the opportunity to do that, then that can reduce some of the challenges that comes from you know, this environment that we find ourselves in. All right, thanks. Sorry for going a bit over time. <laughs> Thanks for that, Nika. That was uh, really great. Goodness knows there's a big story there. Um, hopefully now that your trial period is over, five years, I mean, that's just like a heartbeat compared to nine and a half years that we had. Um, but yeah, hopefully then some pressure can come off you and uh, particularly then if another facility was going to open in the central business district, which is what we're hoping for and we're certainly advocating for. I'm sort of stalling here, hoping that the next presentation is going to magically appear on here and that's not happening. Oh, there it comes. Okay, I'm definitely doing better on the name pronunciation. Oh, you've got no slides. Okay, well. It gives me great pleasure to introduce someone who doesn't have slides. Isn't that fantastic? Emma Maiden from Uniting. <laughs> Thanks, Ingrid. I, mean, I do love slides, but I, I didn't get my act together. So, um, uh, and look, I'd like to also acknowledge that we meet on Aboriginal land today and pay my respects to elders past and present and to acknowledge any Aboriginal people here in the room today. Um, as Ingrid said, I'm Emma Maiden. I'm the General Manager of Advocacy and External Relations at Uniting New South Wales ACT. I'm she, her. And I think we've already heard actually a little bit so far in this conference a few times about how you know, Australia led the world 22 years ago when we introduced our safe injecting facility in Sydney's King's Cross. And that since then, you know, reform in Australia has been, you know, slow to, to non-existent. Um, and, and there's still a really long way to go internationally as well, despite pockets of success. Um, and of course, you know, this is, you know, despite the evidence, you know, that we all know is there, that changing our approach to the way we treat people who use drugs works to reduce harm and improve lives. And, and of course, you know, all the supportive academic, coronial, parliamentary and other inquiries and evidence. And, and of course, despite all the amazing work from uh, great people that have dedicated their lives to campaigning in this space, including you know, many people in this room and at this conference. Um, and so I'm here today to kind of talk about not the usual suspects, how we can re-energise the cause for drug law reform and win. And, and I'm really actually proud to work for Uniting New South Wales ACT, because in 2016, um, we, as a church, joined everyone else that had been working in this space for drug law reform and became one of the advocates for change. The church actually passed a resolution uh, to support decriminalisation of the possession of small amounts of drugs for personal use and to increase funding for treatment, especially in rural and regional communities. And you know, that includes supporting more safe injecting uh, sites, uh, pill testing. We've even offered church facilities for those pilots to happen um, and other harm reduction services. And so we launched the Fair Treatment Campaign in 2018 to do the work to support the achievement of that resolution that the church had passed. And I think it's probably fair to say that um, the passing of the resolution was both unexpected but actually really welcome by the um, alcohol and other drug uh, community. Um, Uniting had run the medically supervised injecting centre since its inception, and so we had legitimacy with the sector. Um, but that faith foundation, it helped open new doors and minds. 
And so, you know, the church is really not the usual suspect in relation to drug law reform. And look, I don't want to dwell on God or Christianity. I never went to Sunday school and I'm not a member of any faith, so let's be clear about that. But I do want to slightly explain the Christian theology about why a church is in the drug law reform space. Because to be honest, it's actually a really fundamental part of Christian faith. And so it's so surprising that there aren't more churches involved. And so there's two, uh, there, it has its roots in two of the me- most well-known Christian concepts, and you know, I am outside my comfort zone here, so forgive me. It's the concept of loving your neighbour and the story of the Good Samaritan. And so the Bible apparently links loving your neighbour to love of God, and it makes them inseparable, indivisible. And when he was asked, who is your neighbour? I can't believe my drug conference saying this, but Jesus told the story of the Good Samaritan. Now, I'm not going to retell the story of the Good Samaritan. You can Google it. But it has two elements. The first is courageous, compassionate service. And the second is it challenges the barriers that people have created between those who are in or worthy and those who are not. Therefore, for uniting Christians, love of neighbour means practical, loving service of everyone, transcending barriers of culture, creed, bias and judgment. And so applying that to drug law reform, the church says they believe in loving your neighbour, they believe in loving in every human being, being of equal worth and loving them all. They believe our current laws and policies see people who use drugs as lesser and not worthy, and they want to do something about the injustice. They are leaning in explicitly to that. And it's a fundamental concept in the Uniting Church, but it's, it's a fundamental concept in all Christian faiths. Um, so uh, I, I know I didn't, I was half expecting maybe half the room would leave, but I, um, <laughs> but I, th- so I think it's, it is really important because it has really opened doors for us in relation to the fair treatment campaign in New South Wales and I think it can actually be a really important part of what I'm expecting to see in the next few years in New South Wales which is the really big next steps and wins in relation to drug law reform. So as well as being one of the largest not-for-profit organisations in Australia, Uniting doesn't just bring God to the cause of drug law reform but it also brings an expert team of social justice campaigners. And that means you know, we have experts in strategic campaigning, experts in messaging theory, experts in community organising, government relations, media, social media. You know, we've also got our, our network of 10,000 employees and 500 congregations. And, and I think that the faith and that expertise will really be instrumental in us winning uh, big change in coming years. But there are a few elements of the strategy that I, I want to particularly call out um, that I think will really be uh, instrumental in helping us get to winning sooner rather than later. So um, the first bit is the voice of lived experience, and, and this conference has already talked about how incredibly important that is. We also try to do this as best as we can. I think we can always do better, to be frank. We have a lived experience reference group, um, and we believe in storytelling as an essential part of changing the narrative around people who use drugs. So when we started the Fair Treatment Campaign, we kicked it off with a walk from Dubbo, which is in regional New South Wales, to Sydney to highlight the distance people need to travel to access treatment services. Services. And on the walk, we took people with lived experience and members of the community. And we turned the walk into a documentary film called Half a Million Steps. You can find it on YouTube. We had a red carpet premiere in 2019, limited release in cinemas, community screenings. And of course, that documentary featured many stories of people with lived experience as well. We also have a number of people who use drugs that have generously agreed to tell their story to the media, on social media, at events, and also in small one-to-one meetings over the years. And when these amazing people tell their story, you can you can really feel the transformation happen in the room. And, um, and it is, I think, a, a bit of a sad reflection because people who use drugs have been so uh, dehumanised over the years in, um, in the media. And so that simple act of someone telling their story, you know, and that they're just real human story, it's, it is powerful. And we're so grateful to those people um, who are willing to do that for us. And we know that when that story is told to a person in, with power, that's the, what they are going to remember, not the facts or the figures, but when they are in a position to be able to make that decision 
uh, about changing policy. It's the story, it's the face that they will remember. The second part of our campaigning that I wanted to call out is about our, us building broad and deep relationships with people in power. So since the beginning of the campaign, we've been working incredibly hard on that. We've got 60 partner organisations, they're legal, health, union, uh, alcohol and other drug com uh, sector, community groups. We invite politicians to come and visit our services all the time and we have a broad range of services, not just, uh, not. Uh, uh, the injecting stand is only one. We invite them to events, we go and meet with them in their offices, we send them cards and sometimes presents and texts. Uh, the presents are, are, are always uh, artworks from the injecting centre. We take members of congregations with us, we take people um, with lived experience and we recognise that some politicians are more powerful than others and we specifically ask them to champion our cause. Um, and we believe that was actually what made the difference in getting the New South Wales government to finally respond to the ICE inquiry after two years, because one politician that we asked and he agreed to actually go into the cabinet room and champion the cause. So our theory of change really does recognise we need to embolden politicians to enact those two campaign aims. And that's because we find when we meet MPs, they're frequently supportive of the idea uh, of drug law reform, but they're reluctant to act. And that reluctance is one of the reasons that we started our national award for political courage. It's going to be awarded for the first time this year, so you can go online and nominate any MPs that you think are worthy of receiving that first uh, award. Um, but the reluctance of MPs to act um, due to that lack of courage is really often based on a perception of negative community attitudes. And it's not a reflection of real community attitude, just those, those loud few voices that Nico talked about. And that's why we, did, we have done like targeted polling in specific seats so that we could take what people see as national data that they don't think applies in their local area and show, well, even in some of the more conservative seats in, the elect, in, the, in New South Wales, their support for drug law reform for the majority of people. And that's why we've also worked really hard to get our message out in traditionally conservative media and with organisations that are traditionally conservative like um, the Country Women's Association, the Farmers Federation, Rotary, because um, we know we don't change minds if we're only talking to ourselves. We've done huge amounts of power mapping um, and we're building relationships with those folks. And um, given the power of our faith in opening doors and minds, we've also been building relationships with other faiths. And we have a Muslim partner organisation and a multi-faith prayer service as part of what we do for Support Don't Punish. We also believe in messaging theory. Uh, there's a document on our, our website, fairtreatment.org.au, that uh, talks about what all our rules are. I won't go through them uh, except to say uh, the most important thing is to not scare people. That means not talking about death. That does, means not talking about law and order. That means not talking about the war on drugs. Um, and the best way to build empathy is through invoking people's altruistic and open-minded values. So we apply those rules um, and we use you know, the typical kind of vision barrier action type framework, but we're constantly working at getting better at that. And the other thing we do um, is uh, we leverage and create moments. So the injecting centre in, in Sydney had its origins in civil disobedience. The Wayside Chapel began uh, supervised injecting to reduce harm and highlight the desperation of the situation, and it worked. And civil disobedience is a tactic that worked then. And, and I, I do think it might, time might be coming again, um, but you do need to change it up. You know, you can't keep using the same tactic over and over again. You need to have that variety. So we're good at that. We're also good at using those moments and creating moments to allow us to celebrate because this is a long road and it sometimes feels thankless. One of the best celebrations we did was when the Injecting Centre had its 21st birthday. We said to the City of Sydney, how about you give us the keys to the city? And they said, 
okay. And then they threw us a party in the town hall. And so it means the injecting centre is there now with Nelson Mandela, Dame Joan Sutherland, Jörn Ertzen, who, dis- who uh, designed the Opera House, one Antonio Samaranch, Unsung Su Suki, as recipient of the keys to the city of Sydney. Um, yeah, so I'm not quite sure how we can top that, but we are thinking about it. So, so just to summarise, because I, I know we're, we're coming up to time and really looking forward to your questions. Look, we know, even though we have resources, we have staff, we have budget, that we can't do everything. So um, we really focus on prioritising and doing a few things really well. Our campaign originally planned to do mass organising, but we just simply don't have the staff to do that well, so it isn't in our plan anymore. But our strength, I think, is our faith and those strategic campaigning skills. And I'm really proud to work for this cause as part of the Uniting Church and, and to bring God to uh, and drug law reform, law reform together. Thanks. Thank you very much, Emma. I must say myself that uh, when I first got the job um, at the injecting centre, I was going to be reporting to the late Harry Herbert, who I'd like to acknowledge was uh, one of the most courageous men I've ever worked with. Um, uh, But yes, I was reminded he was a man of the cloth who had a dual reporting line. And as a card-carrying atheist myself, I was a little daunted by that prospect. But uh, the very first interview that I did with media, I like literally got the job minutes before, was for Compass, which is a religious program on the ABC here in Australia. And the very first question they asked me was what the spiritual underpinnings were of the medically supervised injecting center. And I was like, spiritual, under spirits, alcohol, no, I'm on the wrong track. <laughs> so I was completely, I think it was one of the few times when I was speechless. Afterwards, Harry said to me, Ingrid, I'll answer the God questions, okay? You answer the medical ones. And we stuck to that job delineation and it worked out fine after that. So yeah, an unlikely, um, place for Australia's injecting centre to start, but it has been a great success. So yeah, and tribute, as I say, to Harry. So questions now. I'm sure you've got lots of questions. Um, So if you'd line up at the microphone, we thought we'd do it in bundles, as has been the the way at the conference. So maybe we'll get the first five people. um, And those, if you can direct your questions to members of the panel, and they could write down what those questions are, and then we'll switch across to them. Okay, first up. Hello, um, my name's Hazzy. Um, thanks everyone today. It was really amazing. Um, my question is for Nico. Um, at the start of this panel, we heard um, from people going against government policy and against legislation, taking exorbitant amount of risk upon themselves and the individual getting shut down, getting arrested. Um, being criminalised and we also learnt that government threats didn't always prove to follow through Um, and you speak about risk intolerant government but how do you determine what risks to take and and not to take i.e. not actively hiring peers and people with lived experience and not like supporting them in that space. Um, Pregnant people being barred from the service. Um, By failing to take risks, don't we just emulate the risk aversion of the government Um, and not only become more conservative in the face of that, but we also (laughs) refuse to support folks who use drugs and that's what we're here for. Okay, the next person. Uh, So we're going to take five um, people's questions and then we're going to come back to the panel and have them answer those questions. Um, My name's Pam and I just wanted the website from the lady that spoke last. She just spoke a little fast when she said the website. Sure thing. 
G'day, I'm Fiona. Um, this is a question maybe mainly for Peter, um, but for everyone. With the um, eyes on you from the police when people are coming up to access the service, and obviously you can't, like an NSP, get people to access after um, they've used the service, so access their drugs, how are you informing your service users on how to avoid police, or were you having any run-ins with cops searching people when they attended? Okay, is, so that's it for questions at this moment. Here's another person. Um, so, again, it might be a bit more of a statement slash mixture of questions, but um, so it's kind of already been touched on a little bit, but um, I'd love to hear more, especially from um, Kayla and Peter, about how you approach um, the concept or policies and procedures of banning clients um, and and or how do you respond to bad behaviour? Um, I personally believe, um, and I'd say most of us in this room know that banning um, clients and having policies around this is shameful and violently anti-harm reduction and anti-person. Um, with the exception of a few services workers, community members and spaces that I know of, I've witnessed many local harm reduction services be totally staunch on judging and infantilizing clients for their bad behavior and denying them access to life-saving sa services. This communicates to our clients and communities um, that we service um, that safe injecting or consumption spaces and harm reduction interventions in general are a privilege and not a right and a privilege that we can rip away at any moment um, as a punishment. Um, I don't know the answer and I don't know what the like right <laughs> thing is, but I'd just like to know what, um, yeah, what you guys have done around that. <laughs> okay, so Nico, would you like to start? <clears throat> yeah, yeah, thanks for the question, Hazard. Look, it's really, it's been a real challenge you know, it's it, there's it's, and I, look, uh, it might seem like there's a clear choice between a, you know we're going to do a, uh, we're going to operate within the rules and do it one way, or we're going to go totally rogue and you know do what we think is right. But often there's a there's a path that's you know that that um, you try and find a, the right balance. Look, you have to take risks. There's a question of which, which risks you take. You know, in, even um, you know, let's take something like the, you know, then the, the healthcare provision aspect. You know, many of the things. Let's take, let's take the example of the peers because I think that's the most risky thing that we're talking about here. Let's use the peers as an example. Yeah. 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 Um, sure, I'll come to that in a second. But if I if, if I just do the healthcare because you know I don't think I think it makes it it, it gives a perspective on it. So the the way that we offer healthcare is is the hepatitis C testing, the opiate pharmacotherapy. We we do it differently to the way it's generally available. Now there's risks in all those things that we do. We we kind of do point of care testing on the spot. We do the treatment on the spot when we can. We don't wait for a HIV and hepatitis B result. If we if it's going we think it's going to delay treatment now that is a risk involved in that and we weigh up the risk of well somebody's going to miss out on Hep C treatment but we think well the judgment is in that case we'll get more people treated with hepatitis C and there's a one in ten thousand case of Hep B re-emergence or something like this and we so there are you know there's lots of in in kind of managing a service like this there are lots and lots of little decisions that you make as well as some of the bigger ones. And so we come to the decision of peer workers. That that was it was a, you know that I think there is discussion about what the peer workforce is in Victoria, and I think actually there's a lot of questions at the moment collectively as to how what is the best model of peer peer um, um, employment. We've heard from some of the other speakers that if somebody's been employed to do a job, should it matter whether they're a peer or not? They should be paid according to the job that they're doing. And so that was the approach that was taken uh, initially by the service that, that, that if somebody had a lived experience but then they, then they were able to do the job, then that's great. There's, nobody's going to be excluded from doing the job because of their lived experience and people with lived experience were encouraged to apply 
for the work, but they weren't they weren't specifically peer worker positions, and that was uh, you know a uh, decision that was had largely already been taken even before I arrived. That was a decision that had taken pretty quickly with the government in terms of kind of staffing the service initially. Um, um, and it's, it is, you know, certainly the government chose not to have a peer model. Clearly they emulated everything on Sydney. <laughs> so, you know, but, and the Sydney model was half, 50% nurses, 50% this kind of harm reduction or in Sydney they're called health education officers and, and a medical director. So that was in a sense the deal. North Richmond, do you want this injecting room? This is what we, this is the, you know, this is the framework for it. And, and, and the, the CEO of North Richmond said, okay, we can work with that. Um, and now there are lots of little decisions that come along the way that, that are challenging. I mean, at a certain point, I, you know, there are lots of times when you say, can I work with that and can I not work with that? And there were times when I said, no, I'm not going to work with that. Fire me if you want to. And, and they didn't fire me. But, um, but you, I think you know, it's a negotiation about trying to get the right balance and, and you know, in, in, in our case, trying to have a view on what's the long-term outcome here. It's really important that this 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 succeeds, that the, we get a permanent uh, uh, facility. Um, we might not have it exactly the way we'd want it right now. Uh, are we prepared to trade that off for the longer term outcomes? And you know, different people would have different perspectives on that. And you know, sometimes we would kind of think, well, as a team, what, how do we want to play that? What's our what's our collective view? But to a certain extent, we we thought. You know, and uh, it was our judgment that there was uh, there was a period of time when it, things were not at all clear that the injection room would be you know extended, and you know so so we decided not to push that boundary and to kind of focus on getting the injecting room uh, extended. And while the the legislation's been introduced, it still hasn't been signed off, so that's still you know it's still in that frame, but. Um, but it is a balance, and and you know, and, and some people, you know, you, you might have made different choices in that regard. But I, I always my my decision making framework was to do the best that I could within, uh, with the opportunity we had to get that long term outcome up to a point. And if I reached that point, I would say no, I'm not going to do that. But I couldn't do that very often, or you know, I wouldn't still be here. I wouldn't have had the job, and maybe the service wouldn't have been there. So that try, but that's. You know, I hope that gives you some perspective on, on our framework for managing that situation. Cops. Yeah. Cops, my favourite subject. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, cops, well, some about police searching people. Um, the, 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 the thing that happened when, um, you know, the, the, the police tried to, to get into the van um, and search people that were in the van, that happened pretty. <clears throat> that happened pretty early on, um, when they, they they then charged me with the obstruction in the course of the search under the Misuse of Drugs Act. Now that catapulted us into like a different level of amount of people coming because the three people that were in the back of the van all went out and told everybody else, if the police come, that guy's going to lock the van and not let them in. So, you know, all of a sudden we just started getting really busy and like lots of people coming all the time. Um, and that that copper, that, that copper, because he, that copper made a decision of his own back. I mean, this was at the highest level of press and media in Scotland. And the uh, chief constable of Scotland and the assistant chief constable in terms of the drug strategy, um, they were they were the ones making the decision on how this was to be placed and what was going to happen and how they were going to do it, deal with it. Um, so that copper made the decision because he was I knew I knew of him right, and he was involved in the city centre harm reduction working group. Why are coppers even and fucking loud in the room? I don't know, but there you go. Um, and he's came into the room and he said. What we need to do is we just need to get out and clean up these streets, you know, like arrest people and stuff. And he's the type of sergeant that would still, to this day, have coppers sitting outside 
and injecting equipment provider to search people on the way out. And I've seen that, and I videoed everything, and I put it all over social media, and I spoke to the radio and the TV and the newspapers as much as I could for every little thing, every little interaction that was negative. And we got to a point where they treated it differently. Like, there was one person who was injecting in the alleyway just round from the van, and the copper actually said to him, um, can you go round to the van and have a hat? You know, we got to that point where they just accepted what was going on. Um, and somebody else asked about banning people. Um, yeah, there was no banning people, like, nine months pregnant, out your nut on alcohol and benzos, Whatever it is, however condition, whatever condition you are, if you're going to inject heroin or cocaine or whatever it is that you're going to inject, I would rather that you were injecting it with me. Mm -hmm. You know, like, I could not, not physically live with myself to have to turn somebody away. Um, like I said when I was up there, you know, we carried people into the van who were physically unable to get into the van because they had you know, lost legs. But they were going to go and have a hat anyway. So there was no banning and there was no aggressive and there was no abusive behaviour because that doesn't come when you are somebody who is part of the community. You know, and I've been part of that community, you know. Um, slept rough, homeless, injected drugs in horrible conditions. You know, and I'm still part of that community. You know, I'll never not be part of that community. And you don't get... Like, I don't know if other people have that experience, you know what I mean? Like, I've, had, I've been aggressive as somebody trying to access these fucking sh medical models of service, you know, and having drugs like buprenorphine. And, you know, like if ever, any of you ever heard Crackdown podcast, there's a great Crackdown podcast by Gareth Mullins, um, and he talks, uh, it's called Cop Baked In. It's talking about Suboxone, because it's like a little cop baked into the medication to stop us getting high, you know what I mean? Like, I've been there when I've had that aggression against people who are trying to push stuff on me that I don't want, you know, and I have no need for. So that's my experience. If these, more, if these things are, are run by people who use drugs, like harm reduction is, you know, I said this yesterday, you know, for me, harm reduction works because it's, it's built to, to fight against the system of oppression, whereas 12 Steps and Recovery and the Agenda for a drug-free utopia is built on top of a system of oppression. And if we run these services, we, we, we don't need to ban anybody. Yeah. Yeah. So very much what Peter was saying, we don't ban people. Um, pregnant people can use in our site. Um, our conversation around that really stopped and started when we just explained they're going to use anyway. So I'd rather them use where they have access to resources and we have a family support department that works with parents who are using substances. And so, you know, to say, they can come in the building and if they want, we have people that will help them find housing and do some pre, we have like prenatal care options and some resources and that sort of thing and people felt good about that so nobody's ever gotten upset about it. Um, what I have found, it, which is very much what I said in my speech, is that um, most of the time when people are acting poorly or whatever it is, it's because they're being treated poorly. And... Um, a big, like 95% of the reason why we don't deal with a lot of stuff is because 95% of my staff are people who access services. And they're not, it's not people in recovery or people that have left a lifestyle or whatever. They're people who are actively sleeping on the street outside the building when we close our doors at night. Like these are people in the community. And so they self-police more than anything. Um, the other thing really is we're just really nice people. And I know that sounds really corny, um, but despite my youthful glow, I've been working in this area for almost 20 years. And um, I started my career working in organizations where people were treated really badly. And it almost made me leave this field and legit become an accountant. Um, because I couldn't believe that I went into a field where I wanted to help people. And 
the expectation set by these organizations was that they were highly policed and treated very poorly. And then I got to PHR, which was AIDS Task Platoon at the time, and I was like, oh my god, my expectation was to treat people nicely. And it was a shit storm of shit when I started there, but it was so much better when I came, where, from where I came from, which is why I've stayed for over 10 years, because the expectation number one is that they're treated well. The other thing we do is we train our staff super well in de-escalation. Like our staff, it's the equivalent of almost three days of training um, in just conflict is escalation and like our one number one rule is if you're close enough to hit and you get hit, it's your fault. Um, so don't get hit and you'll be fine. Um, if people are having bad days, it's a conversation like, you know, come back later. Like you can't hit people in the building. That's just not nice. Like take a breath, come back later. Um, but we don't deal with a ton of stuff. And I know this works and it sounds super cheesy. We run youth homes for youth that use substances who, and they are youth who are in the care of our Ministry of Social Services who have been banned from all other residential homes in the entire province. That's their criteria to come to us. They are kids that the government are supposed to be caring for who are told they are too difficult to deserve housing. And we have successfully cared for them just by being nice people. They're not over police, they're not over surveillance, they come and go very freely, they can use substances very freely if they would like to. Um, turns out teenagers just wanna smoke weed and play video games, like that's all they do all day. Um, we aren't dealing with a ton of things and these are kids that in their records have like beat staff to death, almost death with baseball bats in homes before they came to us who have never even punched a hole in the wall. When they punch holes in the wall, we just fix the wall. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's that over-policing and approach. And that definitely comes from a very westernized control model, which is what we see, you know, existing in so many of our services. Um, but the key is you just got to be a really nice person. I've never been hit, or I rarely, and I rarely get yelled at at work. I think the dimples help a lot. But um, <laughs> people, like I grow in men in psychosis, are just like, okay, you said stop, so I'm going to just go sit on the couch now. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, can I just say my website name for you, Pam? Where are you? <laughs> what, a, what a low to finish on. Uh, it's uh, fairtreatment.org. Fairtreatment, one word, dot .org. That was the easiest question I've ever had. Can I have another question? <laughs> mm -hmm. don't know if this... Yeah, it's on. It's not a question. I just figured um, we've spoken a lot about a certain peer worker um, here in Melbourne, um, and I'm not going to, like, name them, but um, I just think we should, yeah, acknowledge that they were very much like thrown under the bus in, a, in an effort to protect an injecting room. Um, and they've been like demonized at, like by everyone at every angle throughout like the whole narrative of this. Um, we don't talk about him in, in that space and the fact that he saved literally like hundreds of lives. He was the overdose prevention site in North Richmond <laughs> before the, the actual service opened. Um, you know, his life was like, basically ripped apart when that happened and like no one cares <laughs> um, and he is no offense to a lot of men in the room but he is literally the only man in harm reduction that I've ever admired and looked up to so I just wanted to acknowledge him so. can I can I just say something as well like I've had the, I've had lived experience a lot um, here just in this session um, and a lot about peer as well um, I think like we really need to think about what, what is a peer you know like mm -hmm. who is a peer to who you know because it's very interchangeable in terms of you know like if I'm a person who used to use drugs I'm not a peer to a person who's using drugs in my opinion mm -hmm. you know like there's a massive difference between lived experience and living experience you know like Somebody that's, you know, like, I don't know, I, do, I, I don't, I, you know, I just felt touched by what you said there, and, I, and I, it really frustrates me because, like, in, in Scotland, you know, as I've already said, you know, like, we are suffering, like, massively in Scotland, um, and, you know, to get a job, to get a job, like a trainee job with a basic, really, really basic salary in Scotland, not only are people required to be free from currently uh, 
state sanctioned illicit what the state sanction is illicit drugs they've also got to be like two year free from their substitute from any substitute prescribing you know right? just to get a fucking addiction worker training role you know like where in, where in any society or world should that be the case you know yeah. okay Thank you very much for coming. <laughs> <laughs> oh.